time. I've, Brett joins us. It's really morning. It's 6 a.m. where he is in Hawaii, uh, Hawaii so I don't know if he's going to jump in, but um, what I'd love to do right off the bat is just have you go down the line and introduce yourself from, and what would you consider your sports of expertise, just in case we have any questions for you. It's nice to know where your pocket of experience is. So you don't have to give us great details, but anyway, I am Kelly Kratz. I live uh, about an hour outside of Philadelphia, and my sports background is in field hockey and lacrosse, specifically as a player and a coach, um, basketball as well as a coach, and I have coached youth soccer. I ran track for a year, and um, now I am the parent of swimmers, so it's uh, fun for me to have it from all ends. If you could excuse me for one minute, I have somebody trying to join the call. Hold on one sec. Hello? Hey, Mike. Yeah, I emailed it yesterday. It's in an email that I sent yesterday, yeah. I can try to see if I can. Is that where all of you guys got the link from the email I sent yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's on the call, and they said they got it from the email I sent yesterday. Okay. Yeah, check it from yesterday. It should I, I sent it in the afternoon. <laughs> I can invite you real quick. If you're if you're on your computer, I'll invite you real quick. I don't want to hold everybody up. But let me um Yeah, I will send I'm gonna send you an invitation right now. Through the uh, through Google Group. Yep. Now he's all embarrassed. Okay. <laughs> so um <laughs> Name where you're from and sport. That would be great. And because I think some people are logged on, we have uh, who's showing up as Alexa, who I know you're not Alexa. <laughs> on the Me? end there. No, I'm looking at. Is that Lorena? Yes. Hi. Hi, Lorena. How are you? Fine, thank you. You? Great. Can you uh, tell us about yourself and where you're from? Because you weren't on last week. Sure. Uh, I'm. I am from Mexico City. Uh, I live. Uh, uh, we are uh, in. Uh, I'm sorry, my English is. Uh, it's a little bit rusty sometimes, but uh, to, I'll try to to be uh, brief. Um, we have a. We are. I work in a company, which uh, we have uh, some uh, trainers in some schools, and we try to improve the the sporting sports sportsmanship uh, uh, with a lot of um, uh, PCA and. Uh, we are, we are trying to do better, well, all, all this stuff, better better people, you know. I, I like to play tennis. I also compete in a, um, I'm trying to, to get it in a professional level. Well, not professional, but amateur level, but uh, in, in, in the, for senior, uh, for senior people, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm a little bit nervous. That's okay. That's okay. Your, uh, your English is much better than our Spanish, I'm sure, so... <laughs> We appreciate you being on the call. It was fun. Last course, I had two people from Mexico City. So the company that um, Lorena works for, they have a Positive Coaching Alliance partnership. It's not called Positive Coaching Alliance in Mexico City, but we do a lot to support each other. And one of the things that Positive Coaching Alliance America is really trying to do in the next year is translate all of our workshops into Spanish and all of our materials into Spanish. There is a big need for that. So. Um, Idea Sport has helped us out a lot with the translations of those workshops. So I, I work with them yes. directly. Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. That is very great. helpful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, um, Becky. Go ahead. Name, rank, and serial number, as my dad used to say. Real quick. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky Snow, and um, I'm a coach, and I'm here in Richmond, Virginia. All right. Thanks. And your sport of expertise is. Uh, basketball and softball, and I also played uh, women's full contact pro football. But I wouldn't say I'm an expert in that. Um, mm -hmm. I just like to share it with people because a lot of people don't know it exists, and it's not the lingerie league. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I had to Google it after I saw that you and Kip. I had two women in this course that were professional football players. I had to Google it just to see what it was because I just saw an advertisement on TV the other night for the Pretty and Strong or something like that league, yeah. and they're playing like full contact football in bikinis, and I'm thinking, really? Did Becky and Kip do that? So it was good to see that that was not the league you were involved in, that women's pro football was alive and strong in other ways as well. So yes, that's yes. very cool. New one for me. I love it. I love it. All right, Brendan. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, also in Richmond, Virginia, there's going to be three of us in Richmond, Virginia. 
I'm an associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University at the Center for Sport Leadership. And my sport is football and hockey. But I don't coach either right now, unfortunately, but I used to coach it in the past, and now I just teach coaching. Very cool. Thank you very much. Jane, go ahead. Hey, I'm Jane Chapman. I'm from Richmond. I went to St. Catharines, and I just sent an athlete to VCU uh, this past year. She started there in August, which is a pretty neat connection there. Uh, I played field hockey, ran track, and played lacrosse and collegiate lacrosse. And now I'm all across all the time, coach high school girls. Um, although I have two sons, one's a collegiate cross country and track runner, and the other is a high school cross country and distance runner. Which they got from their dad because I was a sprinter. <laughs> so, um, but that's my coaching is all high school varsity girls lacrosse. Very cool. And a neat thing too, uh, Fefi Barnhill is in this course as well. She was on yesterday, and she was one of Jane's first. High school yeah, coaches. First field hockey and lacrosse coach. Which is so cool. Such a small world. I love it. Yeah, really fun. All right. Great. Um, and Christopher, how are you? Thank you. Good. My name is uh, Christopher Huddle. I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm the assistant principal and athletic director at a school district in Erie. Uh, my sport of expertise is football. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Mark, Mark with a C. Midget. I'm mute. <laughs> Mark with a C. I'm from Sacramento, California. I grew up playing water polo and swimming. Uh, I now coach baseball. All right. Thank you very much. And Mark from Tampa, Mark Newman. Go ahead. Yes, Kelly. I'm uh, Mark Newman. My I live in Tampa. My sports of expertise, so my biggest one is baseball. I played basketball, football, and baseball in high school and a year of golf. And uh, I've been at, I've been coaching for a long time and just retired a few months ago. All right. Thanks very much. And Melissa. I think you're still muted. Can anybody else hear Melissa? No. <laughs> we can't hear. I'm sorry. We can't hear you. See if maybe you can log out and try back in again. She's in the room next to me, and I can hear her through the room. Oh, you uh, can't. <laughs> you guys can jump in together. There you go. Sorry. All right, we'll come back to you. Um, Mike. Oh, there's Mike. How are you, Mike? All right. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, this first run with the... Uh, Webcam. Um, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I coach girls uh, basketball and soccer. All right. Thank you. Monique? Thank you. Hey, everybody. My name is Monique Lewis. I am in Maryland, right outside of D.C. Um, I'm actually PCA's partnership manager, so I'm responsible for selling the partnerships to all of our partners in the region. And my background is basketball. I played that and coached it. Uh, also coached volleyball. And right now I do more small group and uh, instructional training for girls in basketball. All right. Thank you. Uh, Wendy. Okay. There you go. Okay. okay. Hi, guys. Uh, Wendy LeBolt, um, Herndon, Northern Virginia. Uh, I played golf in college where Feffy Barnhill was the coach uh, at William & Mary, so that connection is fun. Um, I train mostly educational training and injury prevention training with um, women's soccer and women's basketball and a little bit with uh, lacrosse and field hockey and just got a call from a softball player. All right. Thank you. What I'm learning is that everybody knows Feffy and people don't forget Feffy, especially because of the name. but. That woman knows. She's like Kevin Bacon, I told her yesterday. She knows everyone. All right. Um, I think Andrew, join us. Andrew, do you want to say hello? Uh, yeah, good morning, Kelly. Uh, my name is Andrew Pillsbury. Like Monique, I'm the partnership manager uh, for Minnesota. Uh, and so I am here to help support our staff. I don't have formal coaching background, but I played a ton of sports, including tennis and hockey in college. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how I can help uh, uh, promote the culture up here in Minnesota. 
Awesome. So Monique and, and Andrew are both on staff as the sales team for uh, Minnesota and the D.C. area. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, Brett, I don't know if you can hear us. Early morning, Brett, there. Are you there? All right, Brett is from Hawaii, and it's very early in Hawaii, and he's joining us by cell phone because he's not, I think he's not in front of a computer. So, Brett, if you want to jump in, you can. Melissa, you want to try again? We still can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. All right, sorry, sorry. Well, we'll come back to you later. That's Melissa Perry from Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> and I know she has a track and running. <laughs> we'll jump in. All right, because of all the people on this call, I'm going to ask that you all mute your microphone. And then when I need to um, call on you or ask you a question, you can unmute. But because of all the people and all the background noise, it's much easier that way. Um, all right, what I would like to do today is to um, really give us a big picture of Positive Coaching Alliance what we're about, what we're from, and really the simple message that we want our people to take away when we leave a workshop, or when they leave a workshop, I should say. So uh, there's a lot of cool things happening right now with Positive Coaching Alliance. There's a lot of changes going on, um, modifications to workshops and new ideas flying in, and we're growing by leaps and bounds. So there's a lot of energy around PCA and our movement right now, which is exciting, but we are still the face of PCA, and we are still delivering the same message. So we're going to start with that today. What I'd like to do is model again for you the next few slides in the workshop, how I present them, and maybe give you a, a few ideas on how other trainers present them. And then what I would like to do, and what worked out very well last night, was to give probably the last 15 minutes of this phone call, I'm going to let you have an opportunity to share an idea that you might have. How would you start the workshop? What would your introduction look like? How would you get the audience up and engaged and moving around? What would be the solid message that you would take home? Or what have you seen done in a workshop that you've liked? Um, what has gotten you engaged right away? What's an attention grabber for you? What would a trainer do to establish credibility right away that you feel that you can connect with? So um, last night on the Hangout, it worked out really well. A couple people got a chance to share what they do and some ideas, and I really would like to stick to um, stopping my part in about a half an hour to give you a chance to share ideas. So don't feel like you all have to, but keep that kind of in the back of your head as I'm going through this that I am going to be asking a few of you to do that at the end. Um, before I jump in, do any of you have any questions for the good of the cause right now based on anything in the course, content, PowerPoint issues, um, anything like that? I'll, I'll give you a minute. If anybody has a question, just wave and I'll call on you before I get started. All right. Looks all peaceful and quiet. Okay, well let me know if you do. All right, so what I'm going to do today is a um, quick, really quick review of what we did last week for those of you that weren't here or didn't get a chance to see it. Um, last week we talked about the introduction to the workshop. And before I start in, here's what was brought to my attention that I did not explain last week that I want to make sure I do. Um, Monique and Andrew, for example, work very, very hard to sell these partnerships. They are um, going out and talking to athletic directors and youth league coaches and youth league presidents of the boards, and they're selling PCA as a partnership. Now, that partnership can include things like books, which they're selling them. They're also selling them the development zone resources that we have because we have a ton of support and a ton of resources. And they're also selling online workshops. We have available as a product if you would like to purchase online seats for workshops instead of bringing people out to do live workshops. So my question to you is, why in the world would an audience of coaches benefit from having somebody in front of them live, rather than just saying, you know what, it's so much easier, instead of asking these coaches to give up a night, come out to a gym, listen to somebody from PCA, talk to them for two hours, and then have them have to go back and do all the information. I'd rather just have them do it online and check it off that yes, my team has had positive coaching alliance training. What is the value of a live workshop? I'm going to ask three of you to share just your opinion. Why do you think we bother doing them live? And what's the value in that? Hey, Kelly, it's uh, Andrew. Yes. Um, so when I talk to partners, especially about the difference between the live and online workshops, the big thing that I uh, share with them is the ability to have coaches share their best practices. You might have a group of coaches that have been there for 25 years and a group of coaches that this is their first year coaching. Uh, and we want them to be able to bounce ideas off each other, learn from each other as the trainer is facilitating that conversation. 
Um, and that's what I think is the value of the live workshop over the online one is, um, is because of that. And also, with the online one, you get distracted at home. Uh, everyone's guilty of that. You get up, you got to take the dog out, you know, the kids are bugging you. How focused are you on it? In a live workshop, you're there, we get it done, a great conversation, uh, and then they're able to start working on that as they prepare for the season. Yes, absolutely. So that's great. So I, what I hear from you is they like the integration. They like the lot back and forth, the sharing of ideas. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Someone else, what do you see as the value in live workshops? Kelly. Yes. Uh, Mark Newman. I've been to a couple of them and, and seen uh, trainers at work and seen them interact with coaches and I've seen coaches interact with coaches and the discussions were uh, uh, educational for me and the interactions were fabulous and that's something that we don't get on uh, with possible exception of this training episode. Uh, we don't get in, on, in online training. And uh, there were also post-workshop uh, discussions with coaches that uh, I sat in on and engaged, and it was uh, there's a fairly good bit of synergy going on, and it was pretty cool. All right. Thank you. And one more. I'd love to hear one more. Okay. Here. Here. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Okay. Shall I or you? <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, for me, it's very important because it's, uh, I'm I'm so far away from uh, from uh, all of you guys and, and the experience of, experience of being um, among uh, the American uh, way of of teaching uh, sports of uh, training and all these um, opportunities are very important for me and for all uh, my company. So uh, I think it's uh, hearing you guys talking about the, how do you, how can how can we improve. A lot of things. It's very important, so appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Last night, people came up with um, someone else brought up the idea that it's consistent. When you have a live workshop, it's a consistent message. As Andrew said, sometimes you get distracted doing online or or a, another way of doing it, um, and it's also personal. It brings a personal element to it. The reason that I want you to to realize the value in live workshops is when you go out to give a live workshop, this is what people are looking for. And I'm sure many of you have been to clinics and workshops and everything else, and they say, okay, today we're going to get you involved. I want to hear ideas. And then somebody might lecture at you for two hours. That is the death of a PCA workshop. When you get up there as a trainer, you're all excited, and then you just go back to, I call it death by PowerPoint. You have a PowerPoint. You go through each slide. It's not integrated. It's not exciting. And that's really what can actually kill our workshops. So one of the things that we want you to do is take the value of being there live. Anybody can sit and lecture. What, we, what everybody cannot do is get an audience thinking and challenging and, and asking them to get involved and really having them share ideas. Engagement, yes, thank you. Personal engagement, live has more weight. It involves your time, absolutely, which is precious. And I love to put these workshops out there and never ever, and I brought this up last week, never ever tell people that you're going to go through this quickly and and yes, I appreciate their time, but you know what? This is so valuable, and this is something that's going to make them better and make their athletes better. So that I just want to bring up right away. Number two, um, we talked about the SMAC recipe last week. The SMAC recipe were the 11 steps to great PCA workshops. And today we're going to start with, start with a bang, which is also called start smoothly. We want you to have a crisp, smooth opening. And the other thing that I want you to think about, too, is when you're presenting a PCA workshop, um, and a lot of you are in education, and these statistics I've seen slightly different over the years, but the one I usually like to say, the 10-30-70 rule. People remember 10% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, and 70 to 75% when they're engaged and involved. And that engagement and involvement is what's going to make a difference in their coaching. So that's what we're working on. So the first five minutes of the workshop, we talked about having multiple voices in the room. We want you to establish credibility and connect with the audience. And we also want you to address the role of winning and competition. So to get any ideas that PCA is soft and not about competition out of the way right off the bat. And the main theme that we want to get across is that positivity will get better results. And it's that simple. We're going to then go on for the next 90 minutes and give them tons of information to make great coaches even better and coaches that maybe 
tend to rely on negativity as motivation to get them to change the way they coach. But the bottom line is positivity gets results. And one of the reasons that I'm bringing this up is right hot off the presses, Sports Illustrated last week had a fantastic article, and I actually pulled it up on my iPad here so that I wouldn't forget. It is on the front of the PCA website if you didn't get a chance to read it, but or you don't have Sports Illustrated. But it is called, Is the Era of Abusive College Coaches Coming to an End? And it is a fantastic article if you haven't had a chance to read it. Jim Thompson, our founder and CEO, is quoted in there extensively, as is Barbara Erickson, who's another one of our National Advisory Board members that has contributed a lot to our workshops. Um, but it's just a fantastic article bringing up a lot of the negativity, and, and of course it stems from current things going on, and you all know a lot of the current stories in the news about abusive coaches or players that are finally starting to fight back. But the part of the article that I think is so important for trainers is a lot of the brain-based psychology around positivity and negativity. And so Barbara Fredrickson, um, there's a great quote from her in here. And as again, it comes down to our very simple message. Now that I went back to the beginning, I have to see if I can find it. The very simple message that does negativity work? If I were to ask all of you, coaches that you've seen that have been negative and screaming and degrading, does that work to motivate players? How many of you would say yes? Thumbs up if you say yes, thumbs down if you say no. How many of you would say yes, negativity works? Or no, it does not. All right, now, quick debate. Those of you that say yes, negative, screaming and yelling, is that a good motivator? Very simple question. Somebody that said yes, does it motivate players? Barbara Erickson said, absolutely it does. Because it is, our, it is ingrained in us as a survival tactic, negative gets action right away. It does, it makes you move, it makes you jump, it definitely motivates you. However, those of you that had your thumbs down, I'm sure you would be on the boat of, no, it does not work. It does not get the best out of your athletes. So even the Sports Illustrated article has a lot of great um, brain psychological research about endorphins and about expanding your brain and making you flexible and able to everything we talk about in our workshops. So it's so cool to have that backed up. And as I said, Jim Thompson is quoted extensively in that article. I highly suggest that you read it. And I actually might even put it on the next um, Google group post so you all have a chance to, do, to read that. So... Let's move on. Today, what we're going to talk about is the intro. Last week, we started here. We talked about text to sign in. We then went through, you have a choice of one of two videos. We had Steve Young or Kevin Durant talking about their rec league coaches and why they wanted to be a rec league coach. And then we stopped here. This was an activity where in my workshops, I get you up right away out of your seats. As soon as this comes up, I ask coaches to stand. And I'm going to ask everyone to stand up right now, and I would like you to line up in the back of the room. Now, this is what I like to do at some of my workshops. I have different intros, but this is something I like to do. Stand up, and you're going to make a timeline. We're going to make a timeline of how many years of experience in coaching you have. So those of you that have been coaching for zero to five years, you're going to stand over here on the left side of the room. Five to 10 years, you're going to be next to them. 10 to 15 years, and then 15 to 20 years, and then 20 plus years, you guys are going to be on the right-hand side of the room. When I ask you to, I'm going to ask you to stand up, talk to the person around you, get yourselves in order chronologically as to how many years you've been coaching, and I would like you to answer this question. I want you to think about who is the most influential coach in your life and why, and we did this last week. So they've all been talking about who is the most influential coach and why. After I give them about a minute or two to talk, what I'll ask them to do is, okay, what I'd like you to do now, coaches, is I would like three people to share a story that they heard from someone else that they found that was a really great story worthy of sharing to the group. Um, who is the most influential coach in your partner's life and why? Now, one of the reasons I do that is to take the pressure off because people don't usually like to talk themselves about their own um, experiences. Some do. But the other way is it's great to get people tuned in to the other people in the room. That encourages people to be interactive right off the bat because all of a sudden they're going, ooh, she wanted me to listen to that other person. Great skill for coaches to know on their team to get their players to look out for other people. Same way I do it here. So then, as I said, last week I explained. The next part I do is I ask, how do you want to be remembered? And I have everybody think, just quietly, for about 10 seconds. Someday, when you hang up your whistle and you don't want to be a, you're not a coach anymore, how do you want to be remembered? How do you want kids to remember their experience with you on your team? So I ask them to go back and write it down. Again, I like to hit all different types of um, intelligences here. So I have them go back and write it down on the front cover of their book. It also gets their nose in the book right away, and it gets them, uh, I can mention the usefulness of the book and how this is going to be your Bible, and this is something we're going to 
go through. I, I encourage you to read it from front to back, back to front, and often. But we're gonna, I'm going to give you the highlights of that book today. So now, let's get into today. I'm going to ask that you all pretend to be my audience here. And I'm just going to model how I go through the next few parts of this workshop. When you go through the PowerPoint, there are notes at the bottom. Um, if I went out of pr presentation mode, there are notes that give you statistics on this. Again, I want you to be able to deliver the big picture. The details in this part of it, the details are important because there are a lot of numbers and a lot of chapters. So I suggest that you go over that so that you know what you're talking about. But what I do here is this. After I've gone to how do you want to be remembered as a coach, the next slide comes up. Woohoo! Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. All right, so um, after this, I, I might have a couple people share how they'd like to be remembered. It's also a really great way to get people talking. And then I right away I switch to this one and I say, okay, Positive Coaching Alliance is a nonprofit organization. We started in 1998 out of the athletic department at Stanford University. A man by the name of Jim Thompson, who's our founder and CEO, had a lot of background in motivating kids. Why? Because he worked with a, a critical mass of um, at-risk youth and that was his background in special education and what he found when he was teaching these at-risk kids was relentless positivity was the only way to motivate them because some of them had a lot of baggage and some pretty difficult backgrounds so what he found was that when he started into coaching and he was an athlete as well when he started into coaching with his son and watching his son play he found that many coaches were not using positive methods in order to motivate the kids. He found kids were discouraged. He found a lot of them quitting. He heard parents screaming at officials and parents screaming at their kids. And he realized the culture in youth sports was changing. So he got together with the geniuses at Stanford and put together, uh, started asking for ideas and looking up research and sharing ideas with people and asking some of the best coaches in the country and the best players in the country, how did you get to be so good? What did coaches do for you to motivate you? So he founded Positive Coaching Alliance and many of you may have heard of Positive Coaching Alliance. I'm from Pennsylvania. Many of people on this East Coast have not heard of PCA, but we are expanding by leaps and bounds. Right now we're up to 14 chapters nationwide and this is a quick Google map just to show you how big we've gotten. Our goal by 2020 is to impact 20 million athletes and we're also trying to expand to 26 chapters which is a lofty goal but we are on track to do it. Why? Because coaches are seeing results. They're not only seeing results in the way they feel and the way their kids are, are feeling about being on their team, they, they're getting lots of kids to come back again next year and play which is a great, um, a great tool to see how well you're doing as a coach but their results are also improving on the scoreboard. So word of mouth is helping us spread all over the place and results. We can't do it alone. Because we are a nonprofit, we rely on partners. These are some of our national partners that really help us out financially to be able to spread this message. So you might recognize some like AAU, US Lacrosse, NSCAA Soccer. We've got some other companies like Deloitte, United, Liberty Mutual. These are all companies that are really strong supporters of our cause and we couldn't do it without them. It's so neat because a lot of the organizations, for example, US Lacrosse has now integrated Positive Coaching Alliance principles into their level one training. And it's a requirement for all coaches that go through US Lacrosse level one training that receive the exact same Positive Coaching Alliance principles that we talk about in our workshops. So that's really neat. And the latest, one of the latest partners is USA Field Hockey, which is exciting for me, a fellow field hockey player. And more jumping on every day. So take a look at these people. These are the people that I like to show, and if you look at page eight in your book, there's a little bit more of an extensive list. This is our National Advisory Board, and anytime anyone ever says to me, yeah, Positive Coaching Alliance, you're all about soft and cheerleaders and rah-rah and everybody's great, I say, really, have you, have you met Phil Jackson? Have you seen Shane Battier play? Um, do you know anything about Julie Foudy or Bruce Bochy? Because these are the people that we're relying on to help share information and spread our message because they believe in it. Herm Edwards, um, Brenda Villa is a water polo player. 
And also, Doc Rivers is above too, and also players like, or coaches like Vanessa Bernard. Now some of you might say, I don't know Vanessa Bernard. Vanessa Bernard is a coach just like you. She's a youth coach, and she was nominated last year for our National Youth Sports Award. Every year, we give an award to 50 coaches all around the country. And the finalists, the four finalists, we fly out to California in April, and they're recognized at our National Youth Sports Award. They're coaches just like you that are embracing positive coaching, and they're doing, they're doing it because of who they are, and they're passionate about it. So we like to recognize coaches like you. So this today is a workshop where I'm going to ask that you share some of the best practices that work for you and your teams and your players. Share some stories. Get some ideas from other people. I was a teacher and I always say there's no ideas that are genuine. They're all stolen or borrowed from somebody. So feel free during this workshop to stop me, ask questions, steal ideas, and hopefully you can walk out of here with a whole toolbox of ways to make your practices more fun, your kids more motivated, and on the scoreboard it's going to go up a little bit for you. All right, so let's talk about this model of coaching. Now at this point, trainer to trainer, um, you had them up and talking. They were sharing ideas. I had them go back to their seats to write down their how you want to be remembered. So to go through all the map stuff and information, they've been sitting for a little bit. What I might do every once in a while when I put up this national advisory board is I'll have them call out, who do you recognize here? And I'll have people call out, you know, who do you see? And they'll say, Brandy, Brandy Chastain, Doc Rivers. and um, So that's another way to get people kind of moving around and, and talking. This is the next model that comes up. PCA is based on a model of coaching. And it's a little bit different than you're used to because most of us as coaches would say our goal is to win. But when I asked you how you want to be remembered, most of you probably didn't write down, I want to be remembered as the winningest coach in youth soccer. Most of us have much loftier goals than that. What we call those goals are the life lessons. Striving to win, that's why we're all here. Of course, it's a competition. It's a sport. The scoreboard is important. It's a great measurement of how we're doing. But it's not the only goal. The more important lesson the most important, more important goal in coaching is to teach life lessons. Now, let's talk about life lessons for a minute. What I'm going to do, I bring a ball to every single workshop that I do. Sometimes it's a beach ball, sometimes it's a little squishy ball, whatever it is. What I'm going to ask you to do right now is I want all of you to think of three life lessons that sports has taught you. Okay, just think of them in your mind. All right, now, if it's a small group, I might ask us to get up and stand in a circle. If it's a large group, I'll have everybody stand up in your seat, and I'm going to toss the ball to you, and I'm going to try to... We're going to try to come up with 10 life lessons, not repeated. I'm going to throw the ball out, and I just want you to call out a life lesson. So I'm going to toss it to Monique first, and Monique will catch the ball. Monique, call out a life lesson. I know you guys are on mute. It's kind of weird trying to unmute and yell oh, out. Oh, sorry. Discipline. Discipline. Monique, throw it to somebody else. Call on somebody else. Um, I'm passing it to Jane. Uh, time management. Great. Jane, pass it to somebody else. Passing it to... Mike, or Mark. Mark with the C. <laughs> Resilience. Great. Mark, one more. Uh, let's go to Mark with a K. Mark with a K. Uh, emotional control. Excellent. So I would have the ball tossed around about ten times, and people just fire off these life lessons. So you might hear emotional control. Thank you. And I'm sure there's many, many more. In all the years I've been doing these workshops, and I've done over 100 workshops, no one has ever said the life lessons that stuck with me from all my years of playing baseball is how to catch a pop fly, or how to shoot a perfect foul shot, or how to stop a soccer ball on a dime. That's not what stays with you when you're finished and you go through life. However, as coaches, we probably spend 99% of our time trying to get these little human beings to shoot a nice foul shot, or to stop a soccer ball on a dime, or to do that perfect flip turn. So if you really think about what's going to stick with these athletes in terms of their life, it's the life lessons that you just called out. Yet at practice, are we spending time teaching these life lessons? Now, winning, as we said, is important. The goal is to integrate these two. Striving to win is important and teaching life lessons. It's not an or. In many situations, coaches might say, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you just got to win, and sometimes it's a time to teach the life lessons. We believe at PCA in the power of and, using both together when these two collide, a double goal coach will always choose teaching the life lessons over winning. Now what I'm going to ask you to do right now, sometimes these do collide, I'm going to ask you to turn to a partner to your left or to your right and I'm going to give you a minute just to talk about when might these two collide. When is it when you all might say, yeah, I'm, I'm a double goal coach, of course life lessons are more important, but at times winning supersedes. Give me an actual moment in your coaching or playing history where this has happened. 
So then you would now turn to a partner on either side of you, and I'll give you about a minute to share um, that when that would happen. Could one of you just volunteer, pretend you're my partner, and just give us an example of when winning and teaching a life lesson would, those goals would sort of collide a little bit? Mark, go ahead. Mark Smidgen. Uh, bending a, a, a star player due to some kind of infraction, either you know, at a tournament or uh, uh, was bad-mouthing another player or something like that. And then what would you do if, if you chose the winning goal as more important, what would you do? Uh, so you sure you win. Yeah. Keep them in no matter what. Exactly. Right. Good example. So it's another great way to get people talking, thinking about these issues, because it's great to say, yes, life lessons are more important, but when it comes right down to it, when there's one minute left in the game, you've got your bench sitters there that you promised they would play, you're down by one goal, there's 30 seconds left or a minute left, and you've got all your starting lineup in there, and the bench is sitting there looking at you, sometimes we choose winning. But in the long run, the life lessons are more important. So let's talk about this. One of the things that we use, a term that we use in, double, in Positive Coaching Alliance is called the development zone. The development zone is the model that we would like to see all youth sports teams adapt. This is a little bit different than the model that some of you have right now. Let me explain this model and maybe you'll be able to see the difference. In this model, our mission is to create better athletes but more importantly better people. So as we said, as coaches, you will be striving to win but more importantly teaching the life lessons. Now, other than the coaches in youth sports, who is a very, very strong, strong force in youth sports that might change the culture a little bit rather than just the coaches? Parents. Parents, exactly. Thank you, parents. So I know that all of you on your team have 100% supportive parents that get their kids to practice on time and are ready to go. They are cheering nothing but positive comments from the sidelines. They are building up their kids. They're motivating them. After practice, they're high-fiving their kids. After the game, win or loss, they are thrilled to be there, and they're supporting you as a coach in every decision that you make. Everybody's teams are exactly like that, correct? <sighs> Not quite. And this is where I get a lot of, Ooh. wouldn't that be fantastic to have that? Someone once said the Little League Orphans is the most coveted coaching position in the world, and I definitely agree with that. Let's talk about what parents can do. We call them second goal parents. So the goal of winning is not a parent's goal. Leave the winning to the coaches and the athletes. Your job as a parent is to support your kids in absorbing the life lessons. And guess what a great life lesson is? You didn't get playing time. But you know what? I can support you as a parent. If your child comes home and says, Mom, I didn't play as much as I wanted to today, or Dad, man, I only played for a couple minutes today, what would be the response of a first goal parent? whose only focus is on winning, what would be a response of a first goal parent if your kid comes home and says, I didn't get a lot of playing time? Somebody share it for me. Be that parent. I'm going to go talk to your coach. Exactly. I'm going to go talk to your coach. That coach doesn't know what he's doing. He's crazy. I'm going to go yell at him. What would be the response of a second goal parent if your child comes home and is frustrated that they didn't get a lot of playing time? Somebody be that parent. Jane, go ahead. Well, sorry, technological difficulty again. That's okay. Uh, so what can you do in practice to work a little bit harder so that the coach finds that you're that player to put in and, and have more time on the field? Great. Good advice, Mom. So you can see the focus, Jane's comment, has supported the coach. It's put the emphasis on the child to be their own advocate, talk to the coach, and find out what you can do to work harder, what skills you need to work on in order to become that athlete. So our goal in our development zone model is to have parents that are only focusing on the second goal. The other factor are the leaders. Who are the athletic directors? Who are the presidents? Their goal is to support this development zone culture of creating better athletes and better people. And then the fourth person in the drama is the athlete themselves. We do workshops for high school athletes, college age athletes, all the way down to middle school, and now we're experimenting with a few elementary workshops that are coming up. Um, I actually did a triple impact competitor athlete workshop for three to five year olds last year in Tampa and let me tell you it was a blast. We did a 10 minute workshop that we repeated 20 times over the course of a day and they got something out of it and it was wonderful because the focus is 
on making themselves better, making their teammates better, and making the game better. And the cool thing with the athletes is what we share with them is the best of the best athletes in the world have been described just as this, triple impact competitors that are striving for better, constantly better. So as coaches today, we're going to talk about how do you get better. Let's talk about three principles that run through every workshop that we do. And this is what I love about Positive Coaching Alliance because here's where you guys have tools to work on, tools to change the way you coach, tools to make the way you coach even better. And what we call these are the principles. The first one's called the Elm Tree of Mastery. The Elm Tree of Mastery is very simply how to get the best performance out of your athletes based on research. That's it. Number two is filling the emotional tanks. The goal of filling the emotional tanks is how do we get our players in a state of mind emotionally where they're going to be the most coachable and they're going to play the best. And we want, we, call, we have something we're going to introduce to you called the magic ratio. And the magic ratio is where magical things can happen when you're coaching with a certain ratio of positives to criticisms, the kid's performance on and off the field is a magical transformation in how well they're doing. And then the last one is called honoring the game. Honoring the game is where we take sportsmanship and we raise it up. Sportsmanship is a word that's very much overused in our culture and character development is something else that's overused. We went to Disney World a few years ago and I told my oldest daughter, oh, we're going to have a character breakfast. And at this time she was in seventh grade and she said, Mom, I am so tired of hearing about character. That's all we talk about in school. And I said, honey, I mean like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And she's like, oh, okay, cool, I'll go. So it's a word that's overused for these athletes. We talk about honoring the game as utmost respect for five areas of the game. Making sure that the kids know the game is bigger than themselves and they get to see that outlook on life and respect for these areas. So these are the principles that run through all of our workshops. We're going to dive into each one of them today. Everybody sound good? All right, and then we jump into Elm Tree of Mastery. So that's basically it for the introduction to the workshop between last week and this week, that's the intro. And just to give you an idea, um, that introduction from the very beginning slide to what I just stopped at right there from, okay, from this all the way to this is about 15 minutes. Okay, so when you're practicing your intro and you're thinking about integrating ideas, um, getting people up, moving around, talking, that is about a 15 minute introduction. Each one of the principles then, you're going to get into the Elm Tree of Mastery first. That's about 15 to 20 minutes. That's usually a little bit longer. Filling the emotional tank is about 15 minutes. Honoring the game is about 15 minutes. So we've already done an hour of our, of our workshop with content. Usually then there's 15 minutes in there for um, scenarios. We have a scenario menu at the end of the workshop where we can get people really up and thinking and thinking about exactly what's happening with their athletes and how to apply these principles. And then the last 15 minutes of the workshop, I usually say, is good for wrap-up, questions, evaluation, or kind of a cushion time if one of these principles happen to go over longer than another. So that's our full 90-minute workshop that we, on average, that's what the most, most workshops are sold as. So I'm going to stop there for a minute. First off, before we do any sharing, can I answer any questions about anything having to do with the introduction or anything that I went through too quickly that was unclear? Now's your chance. All right. So, since you don't have any questions, um, as I said, I have lots of different introductions that I do, lots of different stories, lots of different creative ideas that I can give you, um, but I would like to have this be a learning experience as well. So I want to know from you, what would you do to get your audience up and thinking and talking? A lot of you I know have public speaking experience or teaching experience. What have you seen work well when you've been to a clinic or a workshop that you've liked? Some activities. Let's do, let's do a little bit of sharing here. Um, and I'm gonna, I think we'll probably have time for about three or four people to share. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to set you know, three minutes for each of you, um, just so we don't have somebody that takes up the full 15 minutes. Um, so who would like to start us off? What are some ideas you have? Kelly? Yes. I think one of the best things to do is get people up just brainstorming certain ideas or approaches that would be effective in dealing with kids. Okay, be more specific, Chris. What do you think? Uh, just maybe things that they've used in their careers or dealing with kids that have been effective in terms of maybe motivation or practice habits or uh, even examples of things that they did, did wrong in the past or other people that they may have played for that, that didn't handle things appropriately because I think you learn a lot from each other. 
those discussions. Yeah, that's a great example. I once heard, I've heard trainers say, uh, and I've used it too, what are you most proud of in your coaching? It's a fun way to start the workshop because it pumps everybody up like, wow, I am doing a lot of things right. What are you most proud of? And a lot of times they'll bring up fun games or things that they do that work well. And then I'll say, what's something you wish you could have a do-over? Is there anything you've ever done in coaching where you'd love to just give yourself a mulligan and say, let me just forget about that and move on from that? So I, I like that idea. Thanks, Chris. Someone else? I wrote out my uh, what I thought be the rough draft for my first three minutes. Okay. Um, I'll read it to you here. Okay. So this is right off the bat. I'm standing in front of the crowd, and this is the first thing I'm going to say. I've got great news for you. I'm going to change your life tonight. When you leave here, you're going to be a positive coaching evangelist like me. I know you will because once you understand what PCA is all about, you can't help but be 100% on board. I was introduced to PCA through our youth baseball league, the Rockland Pony Baseball League, and through the years I've seen some fantastic coaches and I've seen some guys who were convinced that their kid was supposed to be the second coming of Willie Mays. <laughs> when I went to my first PCA seminar like this, it was like heaven's opening up and shining a light on exactly how we ought to be doing things with our kids in life and how to get better performance from the kids on the field. I want to start by dispelling a notion you might have arrived with if you haven't heard anything about PCA other than the name. The term positive in positive coaching alliance leads some people to believe that we're the folks that print the participation ribbons. Nothing could be the truth. We came to the game. We show up to win. A PCA coach, fierce competitor. The difference between a PCA coach and what we'll call a scoreboard only coach is this. A PCA coach is a double goal coach. We're coaching to win the game and we're also coaching with a higher purpose of developing winners in life. Kids who are resilient, kids who can handle adversity, kids who win and lose with class. A vast majority of the kids we coach will not go on to college or pro sports. That's just simple math. But they all go out into the world and need to make something of themselves. We want to help give them the tools to be awesome adults, and that's where the second goal of the double goal coach comes in. And then before we talk about more about the double goal coach, I'd like you to turn to your tables and discuss something for a few minutes. I want each of you to tell your group about the best coach you had as a kid and the positive quality you remember most about them. All right. Thank you. I like but it. I like, I like your thing about lining them up and having someone else introduce the other person's idea. That's... Mm -hmm. Way cooler. <laughs> I like it. I can tell you're a writer. I like the way I like you. You know, you grab my attention right off the bat. I'm like, all right, you know, you're 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 getting buy-in without even asking for it. You are going to be on board. You are going to be 100 percent for this. It is going to change your life. I thought that was great. Well, I, I really, I really truly, I really truly believe that if people can't, it, it's just it makes too much sense. It does, and and a lot of times I've had friends that have said, you know, when they hear what I do, you go out and talk to coaches, like, oh my gosh, doesn't that drive you crazy? Don't you just want to scream at some of them and say, what are you nuts? What are you doing to these kids? And I always, as long as I have in my mind that it's just ignorance, they just don't know what I know. So I like to share my workshops as I'm going to tell you things that you might not be aware of, things that you think you're doing well, things that you think you're doing right. A lot of times I have to bite my tongue when I do parent workshops. Because I'll have parents fight back at me and say, no, 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 you don't understand my son Jimmy. If I don't scream and yell at him, he's not going to pay attention. He's not going to play well. I need to do that with Jimmy. And, and I have to bite my tongue sometimes and think, okay, calm down. Instead of screaming at crazy parent, I have to give them the reassurance that I know you love your son and you want what's best. Let me show you some ways that you can motivate Jimmy and let me know if it works. Try it. I'm going to challenge you to try to be this way. So I like that, Mark. That was great. The other, just real quick before I let somebody else share, um, one of the other options that I've seen done, and again, it's something that can be done very, very well, and I've also seen it turn into a venting session, is bringing up the idea of positive coaching. One of the things, and I used this on the um, call last night, one of the things I like to do is have coaches actually see, visualize, what does a positive coach look like? Turn to the person next to you without even saying anything. And give me a nonverbal. What does a positive coach look like on the sidelines? If you were just walking on by, and they'll go, eh, they'll see smiles and clapping and thumbs up. And then I'll say, okay, describe for me what the players look like that are playing for a positive coach. 
what do the kids look like? And they'll say, oh, the kids are excited and they're listening and they're running and they're helping each other and they're high five and great. Now, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. We know there's some negative coaches out there. Show me what a negative coach looks like. And their heads are down and they're frustrated and they're sh this is all nonverbal. It's getting the audience engaged. Tell me, what do the players look like? What are their actions when they're playing for a negative coach? And they'll say, you know, they're hard on each other. They're lethargic. They're not into it. They might be kind of snippy. They're not listening. And I will, from that moment on, when they, when they describe those two different scenarios of positive coach versus athlete, negative coach and the response it has for the athlete, I will finish up, wrap that up by saying, how many of you have ever had kids that have those negative emotions? Even though you're trying to do the best you can, those negative emotions. You as coaches have a lot of power over how your players are reacting on your field or in your pool or on your track. So I want you to think of it that way. One of the things that I have seen go sour for some PCA trainers is when they say, give me examples of negative coaching. What's the problem with that? How could that be an issue? Give me some examples. Tell me some stories of negative coaching that you've heard. Um, I have a, 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 a co uh, some team, uh, tennis player that uh, they have this problem uh, with uh, this coach. His uh, this coach is very like uh, pushing all the time, pushing all the time. The, and one of the mothers is pushing is uh, worse than this uh, coach. And uh, the the problem is that the mother is like uh, being um, forcing that this coaching to being. Worse, you know, it's like uh, you have to try to push the kids so they have to be better, and and I, I you can see that this little the little girl who's um uh, who has this mother too, uh, this pushing pushing mother, and you can see her, uh, she is almost throwing away the the you know the the towel, throwing the towel the towel because she she's so. She's so stressed. She gets um, she gets uh, you know uh, sick all the time. She doesn't want to, pre to to train anymore. And she's the number three in the ranking in the Mexico ranking uh, for tennis and a 14 year old girl. It's right. so difficult for her. So uh, no no one is no one is helping her. Mm -hmm. So that is a great example. If I opened up that question to an audience and said, "Give me an example of negative coaching," Lorena just gave a great example of negative coaching. Now, Becky probably has an example too, and so does Jane, and so does Mark, and so does Melissa. And as you said, as I saw pop up, it turns into a venting session, and it changes from a positive coaching alliance workshop into a negative coaching alliance workshop. Because we don't need, it's okay to bring up examples of negative coaches and their behavior, but I wouldn't open it up to all the negative stories. Because again, it is hard to nip it in the bud, and people get fired up. <laughs> it's like the media, when you see a negative story in the media, you know, the media goes crazy. So do coaches, and it's, it's like one-upmanship. Oh, yeah? Well, you know what I've seen? Or, oh, my gosh, you want to see this? You know what I've heard? So I usually suggest that you just leave the negative stories out of it. It's okay to talk about negative coach behavior and how that makes the kids react, but I would pretty much stick away, stay away from kind of a venting session. So, but again, it is kind of nice to, to see the, the continuum of positive and negative. I'm not saying that all of you are going to be 100% positive coaches when you walk out of here, but if you have a choice, Based on the research and the things that I'm going to tell you today and the knowledge you're going to have, I think you're going to choose the positive way. Because you don't have to be perfect, we just want you to be positive. So let's go. We still have a, a few more minutes. Um, who else would like to share? How would you like to open up a workshop or what would you do? So I don't have anything scripted out, but I really do like um, using the article or bringing in an article of something recent that might have happened. So the example you gave with the Sports Illustrated article and like just pulling a quote out of there. Um, I've seen some of our local trainers do that. Um, Steve Wilson's really good. He brought in, you know, something about like Ohio State football player um, who overcame a challenge during the season last year. So that was really really good and it resonated. It was an athlete workshop, but still, I mean, it was one of those things that just made it you know, relevant to what was going on, uh, you know, today. Yeah, absolutely. And Monique, that's a really good point. One of the things that we're making more available to trainers are these relevant videos. Um, our Development Zone website is a great database of all of these great things that are happening in the news right now. And we're converting them into videos that you can actually put into a PowerPoint. So if some of you have something that really resonates with you, like Steve Wilson used the Ohio State player, and there's a video or a quote or something you can use from that and you're not sure where to find it, go on our Development Zone website. If you see it on there, 
you can use it as, as PCA material. You can put it into your workshop. So again, it, it does make your intro longer, but I'm sure Steve used it really well as a great attention grabber and keeping things current, which is one thing we always want to do. Great. Thanks for sharing, Monique. All right, someone else. Or what have you seen at a workshop that you've liked? What, is, what would get you engaged? Mason, go ahead. Um, I'd say even starting off with some very easy questions rather than something necessarily that's super thoughtful from the beginning. If you just get some easy questions in there, kind of like uh, kind of like how they script who wants to be a, or who wants to be a millionaire, I think the show is. But like you start off with some easy ones so that people start feeling like they can participate, um, and it's not a stump the whole crowd question. Mm -hmm. But so it just gets people feeling like, hey, I can join in, I can join in and it gets them comfortable within the whole group. Yeah, I love it. One of the things that I've, I've used too, which I love, is taking after this video of Kevin Durant or Steve Young, when they're talking about <laughs> Kevin Durant wanted to be a rec league coach. All right, what I want you guys to do is I want you to think about a funny or fun moment that you had as a youth athlete. Just, just think of something that just made you happy, that when you look back, you just laugh. And I want you to share with the person in front of you or behind you, share that funny memory. It's a real easy, simple question. You get a lot of really fun ideas. And it's a great way to share ideas too. Like, you know, I had one person say, and, I, and I've used it with my soccer kids, my soccer coach used to throw footballs out on the field and we had to play soccer with a bunch of footballs for a warm up. And I just remember how much fun that was. And it gets people in a great tone where they're kind of letting their guard down, chipping the ice away, laughing a little bit and remembering how much fun sports is. Then to link that to 70% of our athletes are dropping out of sports by the age of 13. And the number one reason in multiple studies that have been done is what? Take a guess. Why are kids dropping out of youth sports? Again, it makes it fun, gives them a stat that goes along with it. Do you guys know the number one reason kids are dropping out of sports by the age of 13? What was it? What was it? Not fun anymore. Not fun anymore. So all those fun memories that you were talking about, the reason that Kevin Durant wanted to be a rec league coach was because of the fun. The fun's being sucked out of sports and kids don't want to do it anymore at every level. So again, that's just a great way, Mason, I like that idea of just giving a light question to get it started right away. All right, I think we have time for one more. One more share. Kelly? Yes. Pete here. Hi, Pete. Um, I think one of the things that I would try to do is ask the individuals to say, I would like you to think of two coaches, just think of their initials that you think really positively influenced your life and give them some time they can share with their neighbor there and, or someone behind them, someone next to them and then give them a chance to do that and maybe 30 seconds later say and why do you feel that? What what did they do for you? Mm -hmm. and, be, and be specific as you can. Mm -hmm. Great. I like it. Um, one of the ones, and thank you, Pete, along those lines, too, if you have a smaller group, uh, one of the ideas that was shared with us this summer out in California at our Trainer Institute was by a trainer out in Phoenix named Kelly Hagel, and she does this when she has 30, around an average about 30 coaches. She brings uh, little tiny sticky notes to her workshops, and when they, hit, when they get a book at the beginning of the workshop, she asks them to pick up three little tiny sticky notes, and when she gets to the question of who is the most influential coach in your life and why, she asks coaches, similar to what Pete said, I want you to think of a coach in your life that was most influential, and I want you to write down three adjectives to describe that person, one on each sticky note. So they might write down caring, honest, supportive. And then up on the board or the front, sometimes she said she uses those great big um, 3M sticky note poster size pages, or she might just write it on a board. Um, one column is skills and tactics, and the other column is emotional intelligence. And she would say, okay, now I want you to look at those adjectives and I want you to decide if that person helped you with, you know, whatever it is, being supportive. Okay, is that something that helped you with skills and tactics, or is that something that helped your emotional intelligence and emotional support? And so just at the end of that, she'll have each coach come up, and they'll stick their sticky notes and their adjectives on all of these, um, on the different poster boards. And it's a great visual, because when you get 30 people in a room that each have three sticky notes, you have 90 adjectives on those boards. And, of course, there's some on each but the bulk of them are under emotional intelligence and emotional support. Those are the coaches that had the biggest influence on us. Another one that, and just, just to say this real quick as we're leaving, I've done this with athletes in our athlete workshops, and I have three different columns, making yourself better, making your teammates better, making the game better. 
and I'll ask the kids to who's an athlete you admire most, write down two adjectives to describe that player, and then stick them on one of the boards. And it's so blatantly obvious that most of the stickers, most of the sticky notes go on making your teammates better. Those are the athletes that are admired most, the ones that make their teammates better. So again, great visual, another way to open it up. Um, I'm going to wrap this up for today. Thank you so much. Those of you that shared, I appreciate it. Those of you that didn't get a chance to share, feel free to jump in next week. Um, next week we're going to go into the Elm Tree of Mastery. I'm actually going to also send you a page that has YouTube links of full Double Gold Coach One workshops. For some of you that have not had the chance to see the workshops live, it's got, one of them has a full workshop from beginning to end done by Ruben Nieves, our director of training. And then there's some that have clips of other trainers just giving an example of how they would do the Elm Tree of Mastery or how they would do the intro. And then at the bottom of it are clips of me doing an athlete workshop, if you would like to see that. I mean, if you sit there and watch the whole thing, it's probably six hours worth of videos. But pick and choose and see. Um, someone else in the last uh, group last night asked me if I could send them a list of live workshops in their area so that they could go out and watch some of them. And I said, absolutely, that's something I would encourage any of you to do. But I, the database would be huge. So if you want to specifically know workshops in your area, um, please let me know. Send me, a, send me an email, and I will get that out to you, all the workshops in your area within the next month. And uh, hopefully we'll get you out to see some. So I'll be on for another couple minutes if anybody has any questions. But the rest of you, thank you very much. Where do we see Steve Young or Kevin Durant video? OK, that, this one here, Wendy? It should be, did you open up the workshop? It's in the PowerPoint. Yep, it's the first, first two slides in the PowerPoint. Or if anybody has any PowerPoint issues, let me know too. I can help you through those. But thank you all. Take care. Have a good weekend. You too.